Hello, folks. Welcome again to another episode of Two Chaps Many Cultures, episode 204. Was that correct? I don't know. I forgot to look at the image. Five, two, zero, five. Well, I mean, it seems to be going much faster than we ever thought. And that's our subject today is if you're going fast, you sometimes need fast food. And uh, we're looking at, at least in the US culture and uh, the spread of fast food around the world from this culture, we're going to kind of explore our perceptions of that and maybe some questions we've been asked about it in our work. So stick around. Welcome back to the show of the business of culture and the culture of business web. There is barely enough culture to go around and no, never there. Ne and there's never enough culture to go around. How are you today, pal? I am splendid. I'm hungry. I'm ready for a quick <laughs> bite. Um, it's lunchtime where I am and confession didn't even have breakfast yet. So there we go. Hungry. I bet um, you did. Have, I bet you did have coffee though. Yes, and I've and I've seen you make and I've seen you make coffee, and it's not fast. <laughs> what? I drink no, espresso I mean, by definition. That is fast. Well, no, no, no. Art is ever done fast. That's what I'm oh, saying. So oh, art, oh. the way you make coffee is an art form, and it's never done fast. So that's, I guess, well, what we're talking about today. Well, I'm just, you know, I'm just saying. One might argue uh, that fast fast food is not exactly art. It's something that's thrown together well, uh, to to be efficient. Maybe. Maybe okay. it is. Maybe it is not. So this okay. is the question we're raising here. But before we ask the question or we raise that question, we want to know where in the world are you? Because wherever you're watching this, your definition of what fast food or convenient eats express nutrition is for you that might be a different definition right so both brett and i come from worlds where fast food has this label of inexpensive potentially inexpensive roadside quick grab of questionable mystery meats and other ingredients that may fill our bodies but we're not really 100 percent certain is this really good for us it is a quick fix how long is it going to keep us over? We don't know. Let's not read the labels. Let's not be too curious about the exact composition of that item that we're consuming. Some might argue, is it food? Who knows? So I'm, I'm not going to go into, well, I might go into this because I'm, I will go, I'll get my soapbox out and get on a rant about this. <laughs> um, but we, we, you and I, we come from cultures where, Fast food comes with that almost intuitive connotation of, yeah, that's a sandwich type of thing or something made from carbohydrates, usually some bread type of thing that holds something that is meats, cheese, veggies, hold something together and then it becomes something that we can quickly eat, right? Mm. Um, and it usually comes with certain labels and brands and i don't know what does what does fast food mean to you well i think fa fast food in terms of the we get i you know I, I mean i at least i get asked this question a lot is it why do say a, why does a culture like at the us love fast food and we might we we might kind of also apply the label of what we think of fast food is today it was probably could have been born out of the the efficiency that was expected in the rapid expansion and development economic development of this country um but when fast you, this food, country you mean the us right in the us yeah so mm -hmm. that's why I'm, i you know that's when i think about fast food but i i you know i'm thinking about fast food is not a new concept because you go to the more aged cultures in the world, like China, there's nothing better than to stand on the side of the road and get one of those wonderful pork dumplings that they have on the side of the road. And but is that the same? Is that servicing the same need? Because that has obviously been around for thousands of years. That format of of food, even 
re, you know, a couple of years ago visiting Pompeii. Um, Pompeii has fast food outlets. I mean, it, it you know, we're, and back then it was soups and things like that where people called in to get a quick bite oh, to you eat. you mean back then 2,000 years ago? Yes. Because yeah. <laughs> when I was at Pompeii in present day, the fast food booths, the roadside food vendors around Pompeii, yeah, also questionable origins. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But you look back at the uh, – in the U.S., it was – a, a conflagration of this need to service the interstate system, which was right. established to basically aid and abet the quick development and expansion of this country and its its economic growth through the movement of goods, right, between major centres and back and forth. So if you had trucks and you had cars and people travelling that way for vacation, then there were you needed to service these people not only for their gasoline needs and other snack foods, but you had to feed a family. So I guess, you know, we we've always had fast food in Australia. I mean, I, when I was a kid, we went to McDonald's for sure. It was around then in the seventies. Um, so I guess that fast food, you know, that's really what I call fast food. And also, other people that come to this country might say, well, it seems it seems unusual for them. They might come from com uh, countries where fast food or convenience food is actually much more expensive. So they tend to cook at home a lot more. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, that's what I grew up with. I grew up with home cooking, <laughs> you know, and, yeah, yeah. and, and I'm, and at the moment right now we're, you know, and excuse the noise if it happens, we're actually going through a renovation of a kitchen and it's going to be a very nice kitchen, but it's a kitchen that we intend to use. But I have visited a lot of U.S. homes where they have beautiful kitchens that they never use. <laughs> expensive kitchens, too. And expensive kitchens, you know, nice, shiny, big, uh, you know, big appliances. And um, but but not used to the same degree that I'm used to using a kitchen because I love to cook. And so does my wife. She's a wonderful cook. So that's what I kind of think of fast food is an alternative when you don't have the, the benefit of uh, a good kitchen where you can cook. But. Some people just say, well, that's actually, that's my first go-to, right? But, but, but if, if we're going to keep that definition of fast food as in um, we're on the go or we're outside of our homes, we feel some hankering come upon us. So we want to have something to take away and maybe to eat mm. either on the spot or as we keep on moving, whether it's in the car, on a bicycle maybe, or in the back of a cab or walking so i think mm. fast foods in in many parts of the world have been around for thousands of years because not everybody was eating in their homes often cooking and meal preparation was done in more communal spaces where villages came together i i mean my wife grew up in a village in in germany where they had a a a baking oven for baking bread that the whole village used because you wouldn't do that at home. So you made your dough, you mm -hmm. bread, you, you would prepare the, the, the materials and then take it to the communal um, bakehouse, so to say. So all of this has been around since humankind. But when did it become this convenience of here, drive the car to a window, place your order in a microphone, give them your money, and get something in a bag steaming hot and you keep driving. So I think the US has been, or North American culture, which was the first, I would argue the first culture which succeeded in um, crossing big distances with some level of, of expediency, right? With cars, with planes, with trains, with automobiles. Um, and, and the interstate road system facilitated that even more in the 1950s. And let's let's face it, which which countries had this level of automobile uh, uh, penetration that the U.S. had in in the years in the 1940s and 50s, right? Those were the the golden years, probably, of American automotive manufacturing. The the big cars with the big fins, and everybody was doing everything in a car because it was possible. And from a cultural framework position, cultural comparison uh, position, uh, one. Those of you familiar with the Holstead framework, you might remember there's a dimension called indulgence, right? So U.S. culture ranks fairly high on indulgence. So let's see 
what can we do without um, working too hard? How can we get it in the most convenient way? How can we reward ourselves for something that we think we earned or deserved, right? So a roadside treat, a roadside food becomes kind of a, a treat. It becomes like a, a prize. Oh, going to Mickey D's or going to the other chains. Well, and I'm going to bring up all the chains so none of you feel left out or feel think we're getting a <laughs> kickback here. No, we don't. Um, so th that, that became part of a lifestyle, right? Whereas in other cultures, that may have been seen as something frivolous. You go to certain countries where these American or North American style fast food chains are quite more pricey and um, are something that's out of the ordinary. So I came across a chart um, a week or so ago um, about which fast food company, which fast food chain is most popular. I'm like, popular? How do you define that? And they say, well, yeah. just look at the number of stores or outlets. I'm not calling them restaurants. I'm calling them outlets. Um, what can you find most, right? And here we go. There's a company by the name of Subway. They make sandwiches. Um, since there's 41,000 and change around the world, I suspect most of our viewers know what that is. And look at all the pink colored bars on this chart. All of these are US-based brands and companies. The blue bar here is from the Philippines, Jollibee. Um, our Filipino friends will probably get a, a salivating mouth now just be mentioning Jollibee. Um, but that is also a fast food concept that is built around American ideals of what fast food is, mainly burgers and fries and sandwiches, right? You see here Subway sandwiches, McDonald's, that's burgers, Starbucks, a arguably a coffee brand that sells more than coffee. Some would say it's not necessarily the coffee that's so great about Starbucks. There's other things. Um, what else do we have? We have Pizza Hut, so that's... A, Americanized Italian fast food that's been around for hundreds of years, right? But it took an American company to systematize it and franchise it out to become this level of success globally. Same with Domino's, also a pizza brand. And you see your Hunt Brothers Pizza, so quite a few pizza-themed fast food outlets. Taco Bell, or some call it Taco Hell, a Mexican, Central American themed fast food, and down we go the list, right? Um, what do you call Burger King in Australia? You guys have a different name for that, don't you? Hung Hungry Jacks. Hungry Jacks. But it's not, and it was just, um, yeah, there's a long story behind that uh, about the, the guy that was granted the franchise, the master franchise for Australia, and, uh, and, uh, somewhere in the you know he got around the loophole of using the master franchise name and changed the name to his uh his own but uh because Burger was king was too slow to trademark the name down under I guess. He slept on it i guess something like that and yeah so and i i want to kind of add on to the um the convenience the c word of convenience which and also the but but also add the consistency. Now, I think that that was originally the concept of like a play, places like McDonald's. Mm. Um, and I think Subway built on that and have, have surpassed in terms of location, but it's about the consistency. And you know, back in the seventies and eighties, I remember, you know, eating in the nineties, eating um, McDonald's in Australia was kind of the same as eating it in the U S that were the same offerings. It was pretty, it was bland. There weren't a lot of offerings, but it was basically it tasted the same. It looked the same. It sounded the same. It smelt the same. Um, but now, you know, then there was an evolution once the fast casual food industry kind of came along, like, like the Panera Breads and things like that. There was a, a need for these companies to up their game and become more bespoke within the markets that they were serving. So that's where you see, uh, you know, go to China and you see KFC have variations of their food which are flavored with asian uh, yes. asian flavorings and things like that so there's an evolution which has also allowed this global expansion of these us-based well, which 
I think without that, probably they wouldn't have been as successful as they have been. And you, you mentioned KFC. I think in Japan, a lot of people go to KFC on Christmas, right? So, That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, like like Jewish Germany, people going to Chinese food on uh, Christmas, right? In, <laughs> We've already in Germany, you go to McDonald's. That. You go to McDonald's in Germany, and most Americans will be surprised that among the drink options among all the sodas and soft drinks there's also beer available at mcdonald's in germany nobody told um, me this nobody told me this when how long has this been going on <laughs> it's been going on for a while <laughs> so, uh, well, well, well here's another example for mcdonald's is they are launching into india and you would think for a place like india where the cow yeah. is a sacred animal and you think Wow. But of course, that, that's where the need comes around to say, well, we, we can't even offer our core our core menu because it's something that really is not served in a country like India. So, I mean, that flexibility has certainly contributed to that success. So what, what were some of your um, let's let's go down the, the positive route, because when I think of U.S. fast food chains, my my taste buds and my memory around that is usually not very positive so right i mean so i like myself a good burger oh i love myself a good burger not necessarily this type of burger <laughs> that's how fast food chains advertise their burger typically when you unwrap it or you open the box it doesn't even look like this right so my my right. memory of fast food burgers is not very pleasant however good burgers different story but what, what were some of your and we were curious about to hear that Put that in the, in the comments below or send us a message or chat or whatever it is you do. Um, let us know what is your favorite fast food? What is your favorite quick bite? And Brett, what's your what are some of the most favorable memories you have around fast food or street food or whatever you want to call it? Well, it's got nothing to do with any big chains. In fact, the best fast food that I grew up with was the good old fish and chip shop. Uh, and oh. it, that that's kind of her inherited from our British origins, where uh, the just a fish and chip shop, just a you know piece of fish and some chips and from you know let's call them fries in the American vernacular, but they're chips, you know, they, and they look different than fries. Um, yes, that, that's that, that, kind of right. they, yeah. all of those places were you know, I, I, in my childhood, they were, they were places where you went and bought for a whole family for very, very little money, um, just a bag of fish and chips or a hamburger. And that hamburger included usually a fried egg and a slab of pineapple and, uh, and some beetroot. And, and these are, these are different flavors on the spectrum that you would never see served in a McDonald's. Um, mm -hmm. but it, but uh, so I guess that that's where my taste buds go to. And, and right. those, those outlets were predominantly owned by, like we had wonderful uh, Lebanese entrepreneurs that, 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 but they were always individually owned or they were Greek, they were from the Greek community. And they just really knew how to batter, how to produce a really nice batter made with beer perhaps, and, and to fry, fry potatoes in the right way and keep them crisp. And, and everybody had their own favorite little outlet, but these weren't chains. Mm. These weren't, mm. and the concept of the fish and chip shop in Australia is still hasn't succumbed to the chain concept. It still hasn't done that. Um, but I mean, there might be fish and chip chains in the UK. I'm not aware of them, but there's none on the global scale that you would say, okay, this is a, no. a fish and chip chain. No, I, I mean, even my, you know, when I visit Australia, there's just nothing better than going to an in, uh, an independent milk, what we call a milk bar, which which, which kind of se also sells fish and chips. So you would have fish and chips, you would have milkshakes, you would have ice cream, you would have all kind of, you could basically do the whole, you know, uh, entree to, well, I call it entree, but appetizer to dessert, right? So when you say that these fish and chip shops were often run by immigrants from Lebanon or, or Greece, yes. was that also the gateway then to being introduced as, as Australians to uh, Mediterranean fare? Oh, absolutely, yes. I mean, the, some of the best uh, Mediterranean, you know, Middle Eastern food that I've ever tasted has come from those wonderful communities uh, of, of immigrants that you know we grew up with and we had in our communities. And they contributed so much to you know to our society though it was just 
ubiquitous. <laughs> and so, right. uh, you because know, when I think, the, when it, I smell fish and chips, uh, it, it reminds me of home. When I smell a, a hero, you know, sandwich, it's like, wow, this is, this is, a, this is home, right, for me. Yeah. Okay, so litmus test. What do you dunk the? Is there anything you dunk it into? Is there some liquid or saucy condiment that goes with the fish and chips? No, no. no. I've no, well, you know maybe some people would put tomato would use tomato sauce, but I guess the I I really don't enjoy ketchup or anything on. It's just no plain vinegar? old fish and chips. Vinegar. This is the other thing. So vinegar, yes, vinegar on your fish and chips. So salt and vinegar, and then we also <laughs> I don't know who invented this. But we also have the concept of chicken salt in Australia, and I have never, I have come, haven't come across anywhere in the world that has been able to recreate this. And people here in the U.S., uh, expats, Australian expats, will share recipes about their own version of a chicken salt. Which once you put that on, once you put on chips, they go to a whole new level. I'm sorry, there is nothing right. that makes chicken those things. Taste. We will, we, we will look that up. Somebody post a picture, please. So <laughs> absolutely. You, so we we showed you a burger and most of you know what a burger looks like so there's when when you talk and here's a segue into my european experience when you talk about mediterranean fast food um falafel would come to mind or kebabs or anything that can be quickly grilled on the roadside or like a fish that can be quickly battered but it's not necessarily super fast it's not like you can order right. it and three minutes later it's on a styrofoam plate for you right so there is still some prep work that goes into it but here's here's where central europe and southeastern europe, um almost going into uh little asia or the middle east comes comes together germany has been a an immigration country for the past 70 years even though most germans are not aware of it or they wouldn't call germany a country of immigration but if we're going to be real honest it's been, germany has been an immigration destination for quite a while and one of the biggest minorities or immig immigrant groups into germany traditionally has been that of uh, turkey so there is a fast food fascinating facet um that could only be born from from that uh, symbiosis of turks in germany and it's it, it is the famous or some would call it the infamous döner the döner or i don't know americans probably call it a donor but it's a döner it has and here, here's why that's funny because it's the same letter that's in my last name the ö. the turkish language has that too go figure so ah. the döner the dinner consists of some pita bread or similar, um, because yep. pita is Greek. So forgive me, my Turkish friends. I'm sure you call it something else, because we all know we should not be. Thou shalt not compare Greek and Turkish food, because they are distinctly different, despite all the similarities. And all my Greek friends and all my Turkish friends will hopefully still love me after this episode. <laughs> so the the dinner comes stuffed with meats and fresh vegetables, typically lots of white garlic sauce and and lots of other good fresh stuff and it's arguably a lot more healthy or nutritious than your quick fix burger and fries at least nothing's fried there it's it's grilled on a spit roast and it was developed by turkish immigrants in i think in berlin and from there it spread throughout the continent and you cannot go into even smaller towns in germany and not find a dinner booth somewhere and hmm. it, it it's typically this leave the bar after last call and be slightly <laughs> inebriated and really really got a hankering for something robust dinner is your fast food of choice and you will and all your family and friends will know it the next day that you had dinner because before they see you they smell the garlic and yes. it is fantastic right yes, so this is yes. probably one of more one of my more pleasant memories of, of of fast food that made it across the globe and is kind of a cultural hybrid and i also want to highlight something because i'm from southern germany so there is meat on meat between bread is a, a fast food staple no matter where you go whether it's a hot dog or whether it's a burger or whether it's i don't know in 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 asia you might find some 
carbs with meat together. I mean, even sushi in, in, in Japan, uh, the rice and, and seafood, right? There's a carb, there's, there's protein. Um, our carbon protein in Southern Germany is called Lieberkäsemmel. And I'm not going to translate this. I'm going to just let that sit there. You see a hard roll, a Kaiser roll, and you see this meat product in the middle, and you see that yellow substance, that's mustard. And the only thing they're going to ask you in, in Munich or in any other part of Bavaria, they're going to ask you sweet or spicy in reference to the mustard. Those are your options. And can I tell you, every time I go to Germany, and you probably can tell that it's been a while because Corona and stuff, man, this is the first thing I want, right? I don't even, sometimes I don't even leave the airport before I get me one. And um, yeah, those are the, the, the good memories around the fast food. And I would ask you, what, what, what is served at a sporting event in Germany? So for in Australia, we have the ubiquitous meat pie, which is a, a small pie with gravied meat inside it. And it's meant to be eaten with one hand. So you have the other hand to hold your beer. Uh, that is, that's kind of Australia's version of the hot dog in terms of the convenient mm -hmm. food that's served at a, at, a, at a sporting event. What's served at a sporting event in your experience in Europe? Mm, could be could be the dinner if it's a, a really well equipped sporting site. It could be a simple bratwurst. It could be a hot dog. Sometimes a kind of a imported thing the fries yes mm -hmm. we don't call them french fries because most europeans are aware that the fries were invented by the belgians but we also don't call them belgian fries we call them pommes frites pommes which frites. is french for pomme is the potato or the potato. apple of the earth and frites are well fried and, and in, sometimes in Polish, it's fritki <laughs> fritki fritki well and yeah. G G germans who don't speak French well, they see the, the written name of the French item, it's called pomme frite, but it's yeah. the, some of the letters are silent in French, right? But if you speak every letter and Germans are quite literal, it's pommes, right? Um, yeah, so they they tr they speak it. So here, the fries might come with something like this. This is probably one of the most ubiquitous German fast food items. This That's is called right. currywurst. Currywurst, it's a bratwurst. Typically a white sausage. It could be a red one. Some some places will give you options. It's grilled and it's sliced and it's got that well imitable um, curry ketchup tomato sauce on top of it. Um, nice. Quite overpowering and it doesn't agree with everybody. Let's put it that way. But <laughs> it's um, you might regurgitate it until the next day. But hey. It is a staple that you you find that throughout the country. Well, you might be happy to hear that you've repeated that uh, the word dona. We actually call it dona kebab in Australia. Yeah, dona so kebab. We, dona. we have that, a dona, yes. dona kebab, yes. and that to us is we don't use the hero the the term hero sandwich. We would call a what we would use here. What we would say here is a is a hero sandwich. That's what we would call a dona kebab. And again, to your point. You stumble out of the bar at about two in the morning, and if you can find a place that makes a good doner kebab, it's worth its weight in gold. And I've been uh, wondering what you're talking about when you say hero, you mean, and I don't speak Greek, so I don't know how right. it's pronounced, but you mean that thing that's spelled G Y R O S, yes. right? Yeah, so I don't know if it's Guros, if it's Euro, or hero, it's hero. Hero, yeah, here I'm just pronouncing it here, so but uh, Muros, yeah, I whatever. Yeah. Where's Vali when we need her? Vali can explain that. I know. Uh, maybe she just texted me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would I would say um, the other thing I would finally say is just my it made me think about Poland because is all fast food meant to be an a very or a, not a variation but a separate thing from what you would cook at home like a like a McDonald's you wouldn't every nobody's going to cook cook up a bunch of uh, French fries and make a McDonald's hamburger at home. You go out and do that. Nobody, people make their own pizza, yes, but you know, pizza is a convenience food, especially in the US anyway. But in in Poland, they have this concept of the milk bar, which I have in Australia. But the concept of a milk bar in Poland is 
they serve kind of the same food that you would make at home. They they mm. serve the pierogi. They they serve the potato pancakes. They serve the uh, the 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 schnitzel. Right. They they serve the same kind of food that people make at home. And yet, but <clears throat> this is a place where you can walk into, and you usually um, accompany that with a uh, with a, a compote, with a juice compote. Um, and these are these are foods that you actually can cook at home using the same food in the convenient uh, in the convenience um, mm. concept right which is which is interesting but um, so it's it's just different what what passes for fast food and what is acceptable or the standard of fast food in different cultures I think is an interesting thing to observe when you're traveling and you're moving and you're trying to uh, adjust to a new culture Um like you can take it right to the nth degree and go to a place like Singapore where food is like an Olympic sport and you have to be really cognizant of the kind of food you serve. Um, the, you know, the, 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 uh, um, the, the fast food centers there are famous for their really good food at very, very cheap prices. And these are the hawker centers of, of Singapore. And it really surprises people just how good this food is. And it's yeah. nothing. It's like three Singapore dollars. You know, it's nothing. And uh, yeah. And I think that this is where I draw the line of, of, of for me, at least for fast. There is fast food that is mass produced, automized, standard operating procedure of, of preparing it. And usually yeah. um, with a very tight budget and hope, ideally with a high margin for the seller, which. And highly processed food. not. <laughs> Yeah, and more often than not, it's not really good for the consumer, right? Right. And, right. and fast food that has this culinary uh, uh, self-respect or the, this expectation of being of culinary service to the customer. So there's there's two different types of fast food to me, yeah. at least. Yeah. So when my, my my daughter, my oldest daughter and, and her boyfriend came home the other day and he, he grinned at me and said, hey, I took your daughter to McDonald's the other day and she told me this was her first time. And and he was flabbergasted. And I told him, yeah, this is our kids. We never went. To, we still don't go to McDonald's. So Mickey, right. go sue me or send me coupons as much as you want. I don't care. Um, not not my cup of tea, right? For right. him, a boy who grew up in, in Florida, for him, this was part of everyday, yeah. of the everyday food mix, right? So what we find normal or acceptable in terms of food, what we find what we find ourselves drawn to or not interested in, is often influenced by our culture, how we view food or what food and, and eating means to us. Is it merely serving um, our nutritious needs and having something in our stomach? Or do we view food as an expression of our identity and want to give it a little bit more meaning than simply um, refilling the tank, right? So mm. let us know in the comments. Send us yes. emails. What's your favorite fast food? What's the most horrible fast food experience you've ever had? We're curious. We want to know. Inquisitive minds would like to know. And tell us. Curious tell us. minds. Curious. Always curious. Always interested to learn. It's perfect. All right. <laughs> this is our fast food experience. This was fast. Our episode needs to happen fast, and we grab another cup of, in this case, water. You guys almost, have a wonderful... Almost bite size. Almost. almost. I got a big bottle of water. Oh, come on, branding. <laughs> Sorry, branding. Send us. No, <laughs> send, send the check, please. <laughs> All right. Two jobs, many cultures, episode oh. 205. We're out for now. See you again soon. Bye, guys.